Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started here. Just want to begin by, by thanking everyone for being here. My name is Jamie Williamson. I'm the head of school here at the Windward School, and I'm so excited to tell you that we actually have 2,600 folks uh, registered for this tonight um, across 50 states and actually 44 countries. I think we actually have representation on every continent except Antarctica, which is a very, very exciting for us here at, at Windward. Uh, for those who, 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 who know us, I know many on, on this call, uh, on this, this webinar tonight know us, but for those who may not be as familiar, you know, we are an independent school dedicated to serving kids with learning disabilities. And our mission is really to serve those children with language-based learning disabilities to help them achieve their full potential. And we do that through a variety of different means. One is certainly our school program. We have four campuses, two in White Plains this, uh, and, and two in the city, in New York City this year, serving more than 900 kids, 940 kids across all four campuses. We also run a teacher training institute where we, we, serve, we train about 1,600 educators a year, in addition to a community lecture series uh, that you're here with us tonight. We also have the Windward Institute which has really allowed us to expand our reach to even greater heights with the goal of increasing childhood literacy rates by disrupting the educational status quo and saving more lives along the way. The Windward Institute directly supports the Windward School and is committed to providing greater access to expertise and research, uh, along with uh, research uh, proven ways to remediate language-based learning disabilities. And we provide prof ongoing professional development in addition to forming partnerships with leading educational institutions and other nonprofits serving children in our space. And we spend some time advocating for kids with, with language-based learning disabilities. As a school program, one of our values is commitment. I think there's lots of spaces where what we find ourselves concerned about reading in, in students and learning. But here at Windward, we're deeply committed to, to not only implementing the research-based practices, but also having the discipline to implement them well with high fidelity and integrity across our program. And we also partner with researchers like Dr. Katz, who I'm here to introduce tonight. And we do that to, in order to impact more students across our, our both our, our region and, and, and the state um, here. And I also want to make sure that I, I highlight that an event like this is not an easy one to pull off, pull together. And I want to say a few thank yous, certainly Sandy Schwartz, uh, Annie Stutzman, Danielle, um, and Naja Frazier and the rest of the Windward uh, team, Windward Institute team for helping put this, this incredible event on, in addition to our wonderful tech team for making this live stream possible tonight. And I'm very excited to, 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 uh, to introduce this year's Schwartz Lecture. Um, that's gonna be on highlighting the importance of early identification uh, of dyslexia. Decades of research point to an urgent reality. Early identification and screening is necessary for kids with language-based learning disabilities like dyslexia. When early identification is coupled with effective intervention, we know, especially in the early childhood years, we know it can powerfully mitigate not only reading failure, but also the negative consequences related to being unable to read. And tonight's guest lecture has been a great friend to Winward, and it gives me wonderful pleasure to introduce Dr. Hugh Katz, who is the professor and director of the School of Communication, Science, and Disorders at Florida State University. His research interests include the early identification and prevention of reading disabilities. He's a past board member of the International Dyslexia Association and a past board member and the president of the Society for Scientific Study of Reading. He has received the Samuel T. Orton Award from the International Dyslexia Association and, and honors of the Association of the American uh, Speech and Language and Hearing Association for his career contributions in each of these disciplines. His current research concerns the early identification of reading and language uh, disabilities and the nature and an assessment of reading comprehension problems. And with that, I am very excited to have you uh, spend some time tonight with Dr. Katz. Thank you so much for being here. Well, greetings. Uh, I'd like to begin tonight by thanking uh, Jamie and Annie. Uh, Naja and Danielle for organizing this. I was actually the speaker uh, for last year's uh, uh, lecture, but uh, of course we had to, uh, uh, to cancel that. So I was pleased to see that we were gonna be able to do this again uh, this year. Uh, and I'd like to thank you for joining me uh, tonight. Some of you may be uh, attending this at a later point. I know some of you are on the other side of the world and and it's the first thing in the morning. Um, but I do appreciate the large audience here uh, tonight. Um, given how many people that are attending this, I'm, I'm sure that some of you uh, saw me speak at a conference uh, a couple weeks ago for the uh, AIM uh, 
uh, a group. Uh, and I want to tell you that some of it will be a, a bit of uh, overlap with that, but I've got about 30% more slides uh, with uh, additional information uh, for you, for you uh, here. Um, I'm down at my home in, in uh, uh, Tallahassee, Florida. Uh, you're, you're looking at me on my back porch. Um, I'm not actually there, I'm in the living room, uh, but uh, uh, it's a shame we couldn't get together, but uh, we would never be able to, to interact with this many people. So, so webinars are, are good for that. I'm gonna to talk to you about early identification, uh, research to, uh, to practice, um, I thought maybe I'd start by giving you a bit of an idea about how I got interested in this, and in doing so, you could see how I, what types of things I, I focus on, and so forth. Um, I was trained as a speech scientist in the field of communication disorders, and uh, uh, when I received my PhD, I, I did acoustic analyses of children's speech, particularly kids with phonological disorders, trying to understand what the causal basis of those disorders were. I did that for a few years, but, but at uh, one point, about three or four years into my first job, I ran across a paper by Isabel Lieberman and Donald Shankweiler. And they were talking about phonological factors associated with reading and with dyslexia. And they were different than the types of phonological problems that, that I was familiar with. But, but I was struck by it because those difficulties, the ones that they talk about, ran in my family. Right? Uh, my mom had the problems, I had the problems, my brother had those phonological difficulties, um, and uh, he ended up with pretty significant uh, reading problems. And uh, if we had the classification of learning disabilities back then, he would have been identified as learning disabled or, or dyslexic. Uh, I myself went to uh, uh, remedial uh, education classes after, after school and, and uh, um, but uh, uh, did end up uh, learning to read with not great difficulty. I still am a very poor speller and have some other issues I'll talk about, about later. Uh, but this was fascinating to me and I completely changed my line of research, uh, read all I could find out about uh, dyslexia, phonological aspects of dyslexia, I actually changed jobs so I could teach in, uh, uh, in a program where I could uh, work and, and uh, with students that were interested in language basis of, of dyslexia. Uh, along the way, there's there are people have been interested in topics on early identification. I've done, done many uh, seminars at IDA and, and we have people there interested in the topic, but nothing like what's going on now. Uh, I mean, just the fact that there's 2,600 of you signed up for this, gives me uh, some indication of the, of the interest in this topic. But part of the interest is here uh, as a result, uh, at least in the states, of what's been happening with, with uh, dyslexia legis legislation. Uh, thanks to, to uh, advocates, uh, the all but two states in the US have, uh, uh, have laws that address dyslexia. Uh, most of them have, uh, have uh, legislation that talk about services provided to individuals with dyslexia. Uh, some have uh, 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 laws or legislation related to screening, all the light blue um, uh, states there, uh, and, and so forth. This, this comes from this uh, figure you see here comes from the from INSO, which is National Center on Improving Literacy. And if you go to that website, you can click on the individual state and see what's required uh, uh, in that state in terms of, of uh, treatment, uh, screening, in-services, pre-services, and other information, you know, the way that they define dyslexia, uh, so forth. I also suggest if you go to it, spend some time looking through that, that uh, insult. Uh, uh, website. It's got the great information about dyslexia. And every time I go back to check to see if, if another state has, has been added, uh, they, uh, there's, there's something else in there that's useful to see about uh, dyslexia. Well, it is, as excited as I am about the dyslexia legislation, I am a bit cautious about um, where it's going to take us, right? Because if you look through the legislation, you see a lot of statements about identifying dyslexia, diagnosing dyslexia, 
and treating dyslexia, but you see very little about preventing dyslexia. And when I say prevention, I don't mean preventing the, the factors that, that uh, underlie or risk factors for, for reading problems, but, but uh, uh, preventing the reading difficulties associated with dyslexia and the negative uh, uh, consequences that Jamie talked about uh, in his introduction those are significant, and in some cases, they're they are, they're more impactful than the reading problem itself. And uh, uh, one of the reasons I got interested and stayed interested in it is because of the the negative uh, consequences uh, right off the bat. Uh, um, I mean, this for for a kindergartner or first grader, this is the child's first job right? is to learn to read, and and if you're not particularly good at it, it's not good for your self concept. I know I struggled because uh, all the other kids in the class were learning to read and it wasn't easy for me, right? Uh, the anxiety of, of uh, having to read out in front of, in front of the class, uh, so forth. Uh, uh, other kids have depression, uh, behavioral problems, uh, academic failure. Uh, my brother uh, quit school at the ninth grade, uh, went to vocational school, and uh, 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 got good training, uh, turned out to be a metal sculptor for a number of years, then, a, then he built houses, and now he builds furniture for a living. He's been very successful. He doesn't read uh, for a pleasure, uh, but uh, eventually did gain some skills in reading. Uh, kids that have academic failure uh, uh, will skip school, uh, engage in delinquency, uh, incarceration, the, what they call the school to the prison pipeline starts quite often with uh, reading disabilities in the early grades. And unfortunately, there's a higher rate of suicide associated with kids with learning disabilities, which includes uh, uh, children with, with dyslexia. So it's these negative consequences that, that I've been particularly in, in interested in addressing. And the, the, des, the, the legislation, not all of them, there are some states that do talk about prevention, but for the most part, it's kind of reactive. It's a term that Natty and Gab has is, is used, reactive as opposed to proactive, uh, 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 relax, re, uh, uh, reaction to or, or attempt to deal with uh, dyslexia. And so I wrote about this with, with a colleague, Tiffany Hogan, in a, a recent paper in the Reading League Journal, and uh, uh, it, uh, uh, we talk about the, the need to, uh, to have a preventive uh, model for uh, addressing uh, dyslexia. And we talk about windows of, of opportunity, if you will. And my artist at work drew my window here. I hope you can see that's a window. Um, but the, the typical window for dealing with dyslexia has been second, third, fourth grade. And, and if we wait that long, those negative consequences have already started. Um, and those of you that work with kids that aren't identified until later on know that what happens is they also learn a lot of things incorrectly. So what you end up doing is, 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 is trying to fix uh, things that, that uh, have become somewhat automatic to them. Right? And even when they learn in the right way, they still are part of their system and you'll see them coming back to making those same types of errors. But you know, beyond that are all the, the really serious negative consequences. Well, um, I believe and other people believe that if, we, that if we identify kids at risk for dyslexia earlier, right? They're in a preschool, kindergarten, first grade and begin intervention, right? We can have fewer of those negative consequences less early reading failure, and will be a much more cost-effective approach to dealing with uh, reading problems. And there's evidence that's starting to suggest the, the effectiveness of doing early intervention. Before I get to that, I, I wanna mention that, that uh, you know, what I'm suggesting and others suggesting is something that we've been doing in medicine for some time, the field of preventive medicine. It's its own sub-discipline, if you will, within, within medicine. Uh, as an association and a journal, uh, and their main uh, goal is to promote health, well-being, well, well-being, and to prevent disease, disability, and death. But the important thing that they do is recognize there's three parts to preventive medicine. 
there's a healthy lifestyle, there's screening, and there's preventative intervention. Right? And where you see this uh, taking place uh, is with uh, diseases or conditions such as diabetes, uh, cancer, and heart disease. So for heart disease, the healthy lifestyle would be eating well, moderate exercise, uh, limited uh, uh, stress, uh, so forth. Um, but then followed up by screening, fairly routine screening. I'll talk a little bit about screening for heart disease later on. Uh, and then for those individuals that are at risk, preventive intervention that involves drug therapy, uh, diet changes, lifestyle changes. Well, when I talk about prevention of, of dyslexia, we want all three parts. We want a healthy lifestyle, but for this, that's just an analogy to high quality classroom instruction. Right? We wanna make sure all kids are, good, are getting good classroom instruction um, in, uh, in uh, science-based uh, uh, reading uh, instruction. Uh, it's important that we have that to identify kids at risk, but it's also important to have that to get all kids started um, in reading. The early intervention part is the identification part is universal screening, which I'll talk quite a bit about. And then finally, preventive intervention uh, using some sort of tiered instruction that matches the, the needs, right? So when I talk about early in identification, I want you to put it into this context, right? And recognize that you gotta have the other two parts. And what I see, in, in a lot of the screening work and the discussion about screening, there's a lot of attention on what screener I should I choose, right? Without giving as much attention to what I should do before I screen and what I do after you screen, you find that somebody's at risk, right? So let's keep that in mind as I, as I go through this. All right. Um, uh, so uh, I said that there is evidence of the effectiveness of, of early intervention and my favorite studies by Maureen Lovett from Toronto, her and her group got a, a NIH grant to study the impact of time of, of intervention on outcomes. So they, they uh, uh, developed a, a, a small group based intervention package that was, that was part FAST, which is a phonological alphabetic word strategy test that Maureen develop in, in RAVO, which is an intervention that uh, Marianne Wolf uh, developed a number of years ago. And they use a combination of those. And they began it with some kids in first grade, other kids in second grade, and the, the last group in third grade. And then they assess word reading through the year. So they, they uh, did this intervention, small group intervention every day, an hour uh, during the time where the class was doing business as usual, during the English language arts uh, class um, for a year. And so they measured the, the response over that year and then each year afterwards through the fourth grade. So the third graders only got a fourth grade follow-up, second grade, third and fourth, and first got second, third and fourth grade uh, follow-up. And what this slide shows is what the outcome looks like. I believe, I don't remember which outcome data this is on, uh, but this is the, the first set of bars there is first and second grade combined for the control group and for the treatment group. And, and same over here for third grade. And what you can see is the effect size, which is a measurement of the change, but the difference between the, the uh, control group and the treatment group is about three times that of the, of the kids who started the intervention in third grade, right? Indicating that you're much better off to, to begin this early on. Now, if you wanna look at the difference between first and second grade, they do that in this, um, in, in this figure. The black lines, this is the first graders, this is the second graders, here's their control groups. What I want you to notice is that the first graders have a, have a much steeper slope of increase in ability. This is reading ability, W scores from the Woodcock Reading Mastery. This is a passage comprehension, but you get the same scores for the, uh, uh, for the word reading and, and the, uh, uh, what's the other measure of, of that, that uh, instruments, but, but you get the same looking passage. This is the one that they have in the figure in the, in the article. But the other thing I wanna show you is, 
is the first graders actually catch up with the second graders when the second grader is in fourth grade and the, and the first graders are in third grade, and then they pass them in fourth grade, right? Indication of what we get by starting this intervention earlier. There's also some, some emerging evidence that you do even better if you start down in, in kindergarten, right? And this is just an intervention that's taking the place of what's going on within the, within the classroom where these kids are receiving intervention uh, for their uh, reading problems. All right. Well, to, to actually set up a, a prevention model to deal with, with cramp the right way. Uh, to set up an intervention of, uh, a model or, or a prevention model, there are challenges to, to uh, dealing with this, a number of challenges, but I think right off the bat is uh, how we're going to define and operationalize dyslexia. We have to know what we're trying to prevent to come up with the predictors of that and ideas of how we might prevent that. Well, we're fortunate to have uh, 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 quite a bit of work helping us with uh, defining dyslexia. Uh, in the US, probably the, the most recognized definition is the definition by the International Dyslexia Association. And I was uh, fortunate enough to be part of that uh, group that they uh, shut up in a hotel conference room. Uh, Emerson Dickman, I remember, uh, was one that ranged the hotel and he got us in there, a group of about 10 of us, and gave us the old definition and told us to come up with a, with a more revised definition. And I always laugh because uh, uh, Snow, uh, Catherine Snow always said that uh, there's nothing more difficult than, than a committee writing a sentence. And, and that's actually what it turned out to be, is it's really hard to, to get the committee to do anything. And we put the definition up on a, on a whiteboard and, and wrote it out. You didn't leave the room because if you left the room, then it, the, what you worked on on the definition might be gone by the time you got back. But I think we came up with a pretty good definition of it. Uh, the national uh, NIH has a definition, more recent definition. World Federation of Neurology was one of the earlier definitions, and the World Health Organization also has a definition of, of dyslexia. These, these uh, definitions do share certain features. They all suggest that uh, indicate that dyslexia is, uh, is characterized by severe and persistent difficulties in word reading, accuracy, and speed. Um, and problems in spelling, the speed's there because in orthographic uh, uh, transparent languages like Spanish or, or Finnish, kids, even kids with dyslexia can do this the simple uh, sound symbol correspondence, but they tend to be pretty slow in their, in their reading. It's not only a reading problem, but it's an unexpected reading problem. That is, these kids have had opportunity and good instruction, but despite that, they, they have difficulties learning to read. We also rule out any difficulties in auditory or, or visual acuity and severe cognitive disabilities, uh, but, a, but um, uh, IQ within a certain range down to 70 or so is not typically uh, considered as an exclusionary factor for dyslexia. Kids with, with uh, IQs down in that range tend to have this, uh, similar types of problems that kids with more average or better IQs have, and they also respond to intervention in similar ways. Um, the, uh, these definitions sometimes talk about the uh, condition running in families and being uh, having a genetic basis. If you have a brother or a, or a parent with dyslexia, you have about a 40 to 50% chance of having dyslexia yourself. Um, and it looks to be explained by uh, uh, genes in those, those cases, uh, but we're talking about multiple genes. We've identified some 20 or so genes that seem to have some uh, 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 relationship. None of those genes seem to be, uh, uh, can account for enough of the variability uh, in dyslexia that we could think about using some sort of single gene identification for kids uh, uh, with dyslexia. And the other thing I want to point out here is the genetic basis is a risk for dyslexia. It doesn't mean you're going to end up with the severe disabilities. It just places you at, at risk like all these other things place you at risk. Um, 
Traditional definitions also say something about a neurological basis to, to the condition. It's a brain-based condition. They often talk about a distinct underlying cognitive deficit that makes it difficult for children to respond to typical classroom instruction. Some even argue that it comes with special gifts beyond reading problems. However, the evidence of that is not all that strong. Um, I think in part it comes from the fact that really bright dyslexic individuals stand out, draw attention to themselves, while there's many others that have less intellectual abilities that, that, are, that have reading problems that don't receive that attention. Uh, but they, they, it's open to research and we can look into that further and we may find it, but at the moment uh, the evidence of it uh, is not strong. Um, and it, uh, this, this view often uh, results in the need for assessments of these underlying cognitive deficits to diagnose the condition. Now, the problem with the traditional definitions are we're coming to recognize that there's no single underlying condition that seems to be a necessary or sufficient cause of dyslexia, right? The work shows that there's multiple neurological, genetic, behavioral, and environmental factors, right, that are associated with these unexpected reading problems that, that combine and interact to make it difficult to learn to read, right? And this types of findings suggest that we might want to rethink the use of underlying cause as a required condition for defining, operationalizing, whatever, uh, dyslexia, right? Diagnosing dyslexia on the basis of that. Uh, some have suggested that because of this, what we, what we should think about a dyslexia is as a name or a label for an unexpected, severe and persistent uh, reading difficulties, right? These reading problems don't seem to be the result of an early cognitive failure, right? Um, or a single or even small number of, of cognitive difficulties, but rather the cumulative effect of multiple factors interacting along with protective factors I'll talk about in a minute to make it more difficult for you uh, to learn to read. It doesn't mean we don't pay attention to these uh, underlying cognitive uh, factors. They can be part of the preventive model in trying to identify kids at, at risk for dyslexia. But but using dyslexia as a label for a severe and specific unexpected reading problem, right, works very well within a preventive model. Um, and it also fits well with what we know about reading and some of these other abilities that, that reading and the factors, most of the factors that underlie it are continuous in nature, right? Um, the problems that kids have with reading is they're not, it's not categorical. This is a wonderful drawing by Hollis Scarborough that, that talks about a categorical disorder to where the kids here with the frowns in their face are distinctly different from this group. If you wonder how many there are, you just count the ones with frowns on their face, right? Um, this is not the case for, for dyslexia. I mean, some people say pregnancy is, is this case. You can be a little bit pregnant. So you've got a category here and a category there to where, to where reading and factors like phonological awareness, phonological memory, um, uh, factors associated with it are more uh, 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 fall in a, in, a, in a dimensional model to where we have kids that are that are good readers over on this side and Hollis puts a little smile as on the face and poor readers over here and lots of kids in the, in the middle here. And it's kind of a normal distribution more here than there are at the, at the ends. But you'll notice if it's distributed like this. And again, I wanna point out things like phonological awareness and phonological memory also have distributions like this as well. There's no clear line of demarcation about what's a poor reader and what a good reader is or poor in phonology versus good in phonology, right? We have to, we have to put an arbitrary line there to determine who has it. And in this case, it would be these kids would be identified as having dyslexia if we rolled out the other um, you know, uh, if they if they had had the appropriate instruction, rule out the the few exclusionary factors. But the thing I want to point out to you is that the kids that are down below here, right, have the same conditions that combine to to place them there as the kids up here in this area. They they just have a bit more of that. Now, sure, there's individual differences here. 
But, but even when you find those individual differences, you can still find an individual up here that has that same risk factor. It's just not quite as severe or they have a protective factor. So there's not much of a distinction between kids below this cutoff and above this cutoff. Right? It's a dimensional phenomenon that we're talking about. And that's why I'm going to talk about probability of being on a particular point on this distribution. Right? Where do we put this causal? Where do we, I'm sorry, where do we put this, this line? Well, it depends upon how many kids we want to say have a reading problem. Right? Now, you'll read someplace that it's one in five. Right? To do that, we'd have to put the cut off around the 20th percentile, maybe 21, 22, to rule out some of those exclusionary kids. And, and that's possible. Um, I'm not sure where, where that came from. I think it may have come from a study done by Sally Shaywitz and others where they found using their definition that 17, I think it was 0.6 of the kids in the study ended up with being identified as dyslexic. And so they rounded it up to what to 20% and that was one in, in five. What's problematic is you see some people saying that, that it's one in five people struggle with reading despite average to superior intelligence, right? That cannot be true, right? The reason for that is that to get one in five, 20% of those kids, we'd have to put the cutoff at about the 40th percentile. And we really wouldn't caught that, cause that struggling for reading because half of the kids down here would be below average uh, in terms of, of their intellectual abilities that they're trying to get rid of, right? So um, we could say one in five, but most people who, uh, without talking about uh, uh, average or, or a superior intelligence, but most people who study dyslexia uh, and are, are defined as severe and persistent, talk about around the 10th percentile, seventh percentile uh, as identifying kids on this, on this, uh, uh, on the curve. Now, the reason I like this, this definition is that um, it, uh, uh, it uh, is, it seems to work well, will work well in schools and state legislatures. In, in with the state legislation because educators are quick to look at, at reading and looking at problems in reading and not looking for uh, you know cognitive evaluation, doing a full cognitive battery. It takes some of the mystery away from the term, right? That it's not a mysterious thing. It's it's that that factors have interacted to, to make it more difficult. I, I sometimes explain it, it's like being clumsy with language, right? We don't, we don't think of a child who isn't really physically adept um, as we don't think about well, what's the cause of that? Well, you know that it's a number of things could lead to that, to that happening. And it's the same thing with, with dyslexia. And I think this type of definition also allows us to, uh, 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 for a prevention model. Now, I do have one reservation about doing this, and that is that when we say, when we use this definition and we say that it's unexpected on the basis of good instruction, we're really setting up a discrepancy model between how well the instruction is and how well the child learns to read. And that's problematic. Marco, uh, Michael Gerber pointed that out in a paper a number of years ago, right? That, that we're, we're, imagine trying to quantify reading and then look to see how well the child's reading as, as opposed to how well you, you taught it. But even with that problem, uh, using a discrepancy between instruction and, uh, and level of reading, I think is still uh, outweighs the, the positives, outweighs the negatives. It puts our attention on reading and focusing on improving that child's reading and matching the instruction to the, to the needs of, of, of the child. So despite that problem, I, I, I think we're... Now, some of you might say, well, why, why aren't we, uh, why can't we use phonological factors to identify kids with dyslexia? dyslexia? There's a strong uh, uh, literature showing the relationship here. It's how I got interested in the field. And, um, and it's true, when we looked at the group studies, we did find that kids with, with uh, uh, dyslexia uh, as a group had more problems in, in phonology than kids without dyslexia. But when we started looking at this case by case, we found lots of instances of kids with dyslexia didn't have phonological problems 
or kids with phonological problems that didn't have dyslexia. A couple of studies I'll refer to is uh, Bruce Pennington found that. Uh, he had a couple of samples of kids with dyslexia and looked at their phonological awareness in kindergarten uh, and compared it to their later reading or identification as dyslexia, as having dyslexia, and found that only 50% of those kids that were ended up with dyslexia had a severe enough phonological problem to be said to have a phonological deficit. It's not that they didn't have more minor phonological problems, right? But a deficit itself does not necessarily mean that you're going to end up with a uh, severe and in, in, uh, persistent reading problem. Uh, we did that from the opposite perspective. We identified out of a large sample, like 700 kids, 62 kids that had severe problems in phonological awareness at the beginning of kindergarten. On three different measures, we were pretty sure that those kids were bad at phonological awareness. We looked at them two years, almost three years later, and only about half of them had a severe and significant uh, persistent problem that we could refer to as, as dyslexia. And if they didn't have language or, or problems of RAN, it was only 37%. So using uh, uh, just the uh, a, a measure of phonological awareness is not going to provide us with enough information about whether that child is going to have reading problems later on. Right? This, led, this has led people to uh, talk about uh, uh, multiple causal uh, factors and how these factors add together. As I said before, the phonological problems uh, are, can still be a major, major causal factor, but it combines, and in some cases, uh, other factors operate instead of it to increase or decrease the likelihood of dyslexia. Uh, this better explains the complex interaction between uh, environmental factors and the multiple uh, genes involved. Um, and you'll see in a minute, it's a probabilistic rather than a deterministic model. It's not saying these factors determine you have, you will have these reading problems. It just says that it increases your probability they will. And uh, it's not just deficit deficits because we see some kids who have the same uh, severity of deficits, but they have very different outcomes. Okay? Um, this has led to us to, to think about uh, risk and resilience uh, models. These models uh, had their roots in, in the study of childhood psychopathology, well-being. I was just reading the other day, they're finding their way into uh, the uh, adverse childhood uh, experiences in trauma literature, uh, but, but what they talk about is a set of risk factors that could lead to problems, but, but resilience factors that could reduce the uh, uh, risk of those, uh, of those risk factors. Uh, the mechanisms for resilience, two type, one's a promotive factor. A promotive factor is a factor that's good for everybody. And sometimes it's the other end of a risk factor. Right? that all kids benefit from having, for example, better language, right? to where protective factors are factors that, that have their, their greatest impact on kids that are at risk for uh, reading problems or whatever we might look at. And I'll talk about what some of those protective factors uh, might be. Uh, but uh, Yakov Petra and I, uh, when we ran across this literature, we saw that uh, uh, we really did need to start thinking about this along with the multifactorial causal models. And we developed this accumulative risk and resilience model. Um, the, the, uh, uh, if you might want to take a screenshot, the, there's a paper of this that's in, that's a preprint that's not behind a, a, a paywall. So you can go to that website and get it. If you can't move that quick, you can look on the web for cumulative risk and protective model. That was the old title of, of dyslexia, and it comes up as the first thing on, on Google, and you can, get, you can read this paper. Uh, but we talk about risk factors that increase your likelihood and resilience factors that decrease it. We talked about the phonological deficits. I just mentioned language problems. Uh, language problems seem to be... To be uh, secondary to phonology, but important in explaining individual differences in, in reading. Um, many kids with dyslexia have language problems. Uh, uh, a nice study that was done a number of years ago to show that, Hollis Scarborough did one of the first family um, 
uh, uh, family risk studies to where she identified kids uh, up in the region of the Windward School, New York, uh, New Jersey area, uh, who had, uh, uh, they were infants or toddlers who had brothers or sisters or parents with dyslexia. And then she followed them through the preschool years into school and identified that it was the language problems uh, that were the vocabulary, grammar, that were the earliest indications of, of later reading problems, not the phonological difficulties. Those tend to be a little bit more difficult to see early on. Um, and uh, uh, so those of you look interested in preschool indicators of dyslexia, problems in vocabulary um, and, uh, and grammar, um, uh, the, the, we, we can look at those kids who have those problems and there's an association between those kids and later difficulties reading, late talkers. Those are kids that uh, have less than 50 words uh, at age two or no two word combinations. Uh, Hickey Littman from Finland uh, in a, a really nice study showed that those late talkers did have a, a, a heightened in, increase in uh, uh, in dyslexia when they entered school. Uh, most of the kids that are late talkers don't end up with later problems. Some of those kids end up with a specific language impairment or what do we call DLD? That's a developmental uh, language disorder, uh, which is beginning to gain more uh, uh, attention these days. Uh, this refers to a protracted difficulty in producing and understanding spoken language. As I said, most of these Kids have been late talkers. They have normal hearing and cognition. Occurs in about 10% of the population. We can identify these kids first at four or five years of age. We see the precursors perhaps in, in late talking. Uh, they often go on to have dyslexia. Anywhere from 30 to 50% of these kids will end up with word reading problems. And then some of the kids that don't end up with word reading problems will end up being poor comprehenders. That is, kids that have good word reading, but poor comprehension. So in a way, kids with a DLD are as much at risk and we should pay as much attention about screening for those kids and setting up a prevention model for those kids as we do for kids with dyslexia, right? Because they're at risk for both dyslexia and problems in comprehension. And the reason I say that it say that is because that it's hidden in some way. We, we don't tend to identify these kids until they get to school and often have reading problems uh, that about 50% of them are, aren't identified through the, the typical uh, screening or parents uh, intakes within schools and so forth. And we, we need to pay attention to it because these kids are uh, at uh, a significant risk for academic uh, difficulties. Uh, there are some uh, national associations that are that are uh, uh, working to draw attention to that. The the uh, uh, the, the uh, raising awareness uh, is is an international one. The DLD is uh, one in the states, and there is some movement to uh, develop some screening tools. Tiffany Hogan and one of her students has has written this paper, it's not out yet, but again, here's the preprint uh, uh, ID for it. So you can go to the to preprints uh, and the archives and get that paper. And it lists some of the, the uh, uh, screeners for, for language impairment. Um, the attentional deficits may be another risk factor, uh, uh, visual problems. I talk about risk, visual problems, I'm not talking about seeing things backwards um, or eye tracking difficulties or visual stress where you would need to have some sort of colored lenses. Those aren't major contributing factors to dyslexia. Rather, it seems to be uh, problems in motion uh, detection. Um, uh, we move our eyes during reading and, and if, if we have problems in inhibiting uh, uh, vision during those eye movements, we can cause some masking. Uh, there's some indication that there might be problems in, in uh, attention in terms of, the, of the, the width of attention span uh, and in the movement uh, within attention, visual crowding in the periphery. 
uh, that may be something that the, that the uh, dyslexia font was getting at and not the, the form of those, those letters. There's some indication of that. It's, it's not, uh, uh, not all studies are suggesting that. Uh, there is some indication that for some individuals uh, that can be useful for reading, but just emerging uh, research. At, at this point, it's not enough to, to where we should all go to all books written with, with letters and, and words further, further apart, but we need to uh, follow up on that. That's, uh, that's some interesting uh, literature there. Uh, trauma. Uh, is an area that we, we haven't really focused on all that much in the, in the dyslexia literature because we've kind of thought of that as an environmental effect and, and dyslexia is a brain-based disorder. But it turns out trauma is also a brain-based disorder uh, as well. And it's going to increase risk if you have some of these other risk factors. Uh, we're beginning to pay more attention to adverse childhood experiences, things such as physical, emotional, and, and uh a sexual and emotional uh, abuse, uh, neglect, a sudden loss of a uh, family member, uh, so forth. These can uh, be uh, lead to to toxic stress, um, which has neurological consequences. It changes the brain. Now, these are fairly common. There was a study done that showed about 60% of adults have had some sort of adverse childhood experiences. So it's probably the cumulative effects, right? Dosage that that interacts with other, um, uh, with other factors. Uh, other people have started thinking about particular uh, adverse childhood experiences. They're called traces. That's trauma and adverse childhood experiences. And those are the ones with the stars up here, the asterisks up here, and even one by neglect too. Um, and those may be more likely to be associated with significant uh, adverse outcomes but it's also the core occurrence with these factors. Other interesting things is that these uh, adverse effects go across generations. They go across generations, not only in behavioral and environmental pathways, that is parents who've experienced trauma behave and set up environments that are different for their kids, that the, uh, the effects on their parents' brains actually uh, influence the way genes are expressed, not only in, in, in their life, but in the, gets passed to the child, to children. So uh, in dealing with this, we're talking about, uh, you know, uh, multiple generation effects in the, in the impact of trauma. The other thing it allows us to do though, is to uh, find out uh, a risk for trauma by asking parents about their traumatic experiences, which parents, are often willing to provide to where we're not able to get that information from a five-year-old or so forth. And, and there's some uh, uh, initial indication that that information is uh, uh, indicative of some degree of risk for later reading. All right, on the other side, there's resilience factors. Uh, there's the, the most important resilience factors in structure. Right. That's the most protective factor, right? We need to have instruction for all kids to learn to read, but kids that, that struggle with reading benefit more from specialized reading instruction, right? Instruction that's more systematic, more structured, more intensive, um, um, and, and uh, more supportive. Uh, and uh, they look to benefit more from that type of instruction than, than kids that, that aren't at risk. Uh, growth mindset is another risk factor that, that we've uh, uh, looked at. Um, that's the idea that you grow in, you can grow in your intelligence, but it's also been translated down to other, uh, other factors like uh, the notion that you can get better at almost anything. Today, I, well, I was talking to one of my doc students who was struggling with, with statistics, and I was asking her whether she had a uh, good growth mindset for statistics, and she believed that she could get better. Right? Uh, <clears throat> but uh, uh, we've been interested in this related to uh, reading. Um, the relationship in the studies have not come out to show a very strong relationship there. When we look, a, look a, across studies, the meta-analyses, but, but uh, other studies that have looked more specifically at kids at risk, my colleague, uh, uh, Yakov Petcher found in one of his studies that 
that kids that were at risk uh, were differentiated more by their growth mindset than kids that weren't as uh, uh, at risk for, for reading. Yakov also showed that, that the measure uh, may be multidimensional and that the factor uh, that the factors that may be important in there are this notion that you can grow, but also something related to effort, right? The amount of, of perseverance that you put into your desire to get better. You know you can get better, but you have to actually act on that. That's sometimes called task-focused behavior or grit. A lot of attention on grit, a lot of attention training grit. It doesn't look to be something that's easily trained. Um, it looks to be have, have uh, somewhat of a constitutional uh, origin to it. Uh, we may be able to uh, to improve it, but but uh, some people just seem to be more persistent. Uh, there's a smaller part of it that may be related to passion or interest, uh, but it's mostly the perseverance is what the what the meta analysis suggests that that's part of that. Um, other uh, re resilience factors are, are, are related to the affective nature of reading problems. As I said before, having a reading problem is a pretty significant thing. Having experienced myself, right, uh, reading becomes pretty aversive. <laughs> you avoid it the best you can. You act out if you're required to do it, and you freeze up when you have to do it. Um, you get accused of not trying very hard. Other kids don't think you're very smart. You begin to think you're not very smart, right? And it, and it really does affect, uh, affect you. However, some kids seem to respond a little bit better. Some kids have, have the notion that the world's more predictable and that their actions can have some impact on the world. It's kind of like growth uh, uh, mindset. Uh, some people are less frustrated by failure. I know I was less frustrated by failure than my brother was. Uh, I was determined I was going to learn how to do this. I was interested in it. It looked like a pretty neat thing to do, associated with learning all sorts of stuff in these books, um, and so forth. Um, some people have higher aspirations. There's it, some work with hope that's kind of interesting. Hopeful people tend to have higher goals and work harder toward achieving those goals. Uh, Teachers turn out to, to play a, an important role, not in just providing the instruction, but understanding the condition, right? recognizing that, that it is this kind of clumsiness with language that explicit, systematic, intensive intervention can, uh, can have an impact on, providing uh, emotional support, encouragement, recognizing the the negative consequences that are association with this mitigating the peer interactions, helping uh, kids so that their peers don't make fun of them, that they develop friendships and so forth. Uh, teachers play an important role. Parents can play an important role in that as well. All right, so what, what are the implications for, for intervention or for early identification? Well, we're gonna have to use multiple factors. We're gonna have to look at both risk and resilience. And we're going to have to recognize that this is a probabilistic uh, uh, setup. As far as the early predictors, when we do screening, we're going to want to be looking at phonological factors. Phonological awareness, phonological memory tend to be the, the two that, that we pay the most attention to. Rapid naming, speed of processing seems to be an indicator. Said oral language, particularly uh, spoken oral language, like sentence imitation, which has a part of phonological memory associated with it. Uh, EV is expressive vocabulary, and then early literacy. And that's typically are what you see in these screeners that are being used regularly out there in the field. Uh, a couple examples of that are the PAR. It's been around for a while, predictive assessment of reading. Uh, the TPRI um, uh, is one developed in Texas by Barbara Foreman and colleagues. Been around for a long time. They recently developed a screening test associated with it. The Mississippi Dyslexia Screener. Mississippi's doing great stuff with early identification prevention of dyslexia. And this is the attempt to screen for it. And then finally, the instrument that Nadine Gab uh, developed, uh, it's called the Boston Children uh, Literacy Screener. Sometimes you see it as the uh, Early bird, I think, is another name for it. 
And the, uh, 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 what it does on the, on the right here is it has non-word repetition, RAN, letter names, vocabulary, and oral sentence comprehension. It's in a game-like situation. And it can be done with in the preschool, kindergarten, uh, kids, uh, I like this. I think it's going to be uh, a useful instrument uh, uh, as we start to get better with our development of screening tools. Um, we also see the reinvention of previous instruments into dyslexia screeners, if you will. Right? So the benchmark and progress monitoring measures that people used to tell me were not measures to screen for dyslexia have with the market become screening measures for dyslexia, right? That's not a bad thing because these, these do provide some important information about, about dyslexia. Dibbles, Ames Web, Easy, CBM, and FAST do have components on there uh, with letter naming, phonological awareness, so forth that are, that are uh, uh, indicators of, of risk for dyslexia. Same thing's true for, for broader literacy assessments like Lexi, iStation, STAR, and, and iReady um, ha, are being used in some states for, for screening because they have these components that I talk about. The thing we have to recognize is these instruments are only going to be so good, right? The problem is it's hard to predict, right? Um, what is his name? Um, oh. We say that uh, Yogi Berra has always said that it's hard to make predictions, especially about the future, right? That, that we're talking about predicting several years out with young kindergartners, right? And so where there's going to be some error in here and we're not going to be as accurate as we might want to be. There's lots of false positives. And you can see how accurate these instruments are by looking at the, um, the, the this is a tools chart that's part that's it can be located at NASA, National Center for Intensive Intervention. And this, this center has groups of researchers and practitioners that work with them. I'm on the screening team and vendors provide data from their screening instrument. And then we evaluate that much like uh, the, uh, what do you call that? The, uh, you got the consumer reports. So we give the, little bubbles and so forth. And you'll see that most of these instruments really only have half bubbles for classification accuracy. Not a problem, it's not that they're bad instruments, it's just hard to identify kids at, at risk with the accuracy that we might want so we can limit the number of kids that we have to do additional intervention with, who you might call false positives or whatever. So we're gonna have to add to that other information, family history right off the bat. We have to figure out a way to get family history into the intake at school to have an indication of potential risk. It doesn't mean just because a child has a parent or a brother that they're going to have it, but we would like to know that so that when we see other signs in our screening test, we have a better indication that, that we may want to switch up the type of instruction for this child because they're at a heightened risk. Also, children's early language development ought to be part of that intake. All right, we ought to find out what, what the milestones are for that child. Home language, is, is English their uh, majority language or is it some other language? Literacy experience. Some of these child characteristics, we could do at intake. We could have parents rating of their kids on some of these uh, uh, you know, things like perseverance um, uh, uh, and so forth. But, you know, as we begin to figure out which ones add to the other predictors, right? So we don't know right now what they might be, but we may know that in the future. A parent's indication of trauma that they may have experienced, childhood adverse experiences. We need to figure a way to put those into their, our screening tools to, to provide a, additional information. We also are are developing uh, computer uh, adaptive uh, uh, tests, which allow us to move more quickly through our assessments. We're looking at response speed, eye movements, not because of problems in eye movements, but uh, 
Uh, but uh, with eye movements telling you something about what's going on in the brain. So we're working with Google at the moment to try to see if we can uh, get any information from eye movements that might be helpful. Speech recognition, well, we're also our team's working with that as well to try to see if we can we can have these screeners so that 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 we don't need an additional person there to do the, the scoring of them. Uh, we're working with gamification to making the instruments uh, more uh, entertaining for kids. But kindergartners will do almost anything you want them to do for 20 minutes, right? They love to participate in these activities. And, you know, we, all, the gamification, I think, is probably more important for the little older kids. We're also using risk calculators, which is not a new idea, but they're becoming used more often. Now, remember, I talked about probability of having a problem and how, uh, how preventive medicine has, has uh, taken this in consideration. I got about 10 more minutes if you're trying to gauge how much longer. I know if you've held on for an hour and, and five, well, that's about an hour. I appreciate your attention. Um, the, uh, the, I want, here's my analogy for screening with uh, in cardiovascular disease. Uh, they developed uh, a, a, a risk calculator, oh, what about eight or nine years ago, that I actually discovered, not in the literature, but in the physician's office. Right? My physician took the information here about age, gender, race, and you know, cholesterol, blood pressure, and so forth, um, and then calculated the probability that I was going to have a heart uh, incident within the next 10 years. Right? Uh, kind of the same way that I'm talking about a indicator of risk for dyslexia. And on the basis of that, you know, we decide to do certain things like cholesterol um, uh, medication or, or uh, uh, medication for blood pressure and, and so forth. Uh, but we can do the same thing for, for reading disabilities. And, and uh, we actually did this 20 years ago, uh, not because of my insight, but from uh, 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 one of our statisticians uh, thought about this as a way to, to quantify risk. Um, we had a, a given a group of, uh, a large group of kindergartners uh, a, a measure, measures of reading in, in the second half of kindergarten to predict end of second grade reading. And we developed an algorithm, right, uh, which is shown here. And this is a probability of a reading a disability. What it is, it's a combination of five measures, each having a multiple a, a multiplier in front of it, and a way that it interacts with the other variables in some constants to tell us what the probability that child's going to have a, a reading problem, right? It's okay. It was okay at the time, right? Uh, uh, I actually created an Excel file of this and sent it out to people with the, with the measures here, uh, and people did use it. But this is what I'm suggesting that we use for, uh, for uh, figuring out probability now by adding things like family history, uh, uh, some of the other uh, indicators that I've talked about into this, and what comes out is probability of reading difficulty. That's going to be under the hood, probably. All right. And what you're going to see is a scale, you know, like high risk, uh, low risk, um, uh, no risk. Um, but if you want to look under that and make some distinctions, that's what this probability of risk is going to, going to give you. All right. Um, we're going to want to combine this with uh, actual reading behavior because the best predictor of later reading is current reading. All right but it has four effects initially. So you're gonna need more information. We showed that in a study and I'm gonna to go to this quickly. We had 18,000 kids available to where we can look at their distribution on dibbles. And so these are dibbles measures here. And this is oral reading fluency at first grade September. And this is the uh, uh, words read accurately in a minute. And this is the number of kids that have it. So you see the floor effect here? it doesn't disappear until well into second grade, which means if you're using that measure alone to identify kids at risk, you got well over half the kids that would be at risk, right? Because it takes time for kids to spread themselves out in their reading ability. 
Now, this is probably earlier here because this was done 20 years ago. These data were collected 20 years ago before No Child Left Behind and all the work we've done. And the reason I can say that, you've got a floor effect in September for letter naming. Here's what we got last year for letter naming, or two years ago, letter naming in October of kindergarten. Nice normal distribution. But even there, we're going to need some other things because this is in part due to experience, initial experience. It's not just your ability to learn letters, all right? So we're gonna to wanna to add some of these other factors. We're gonna to wanna to put it put this in a, in a multi-tier approach. Um, as I said before, we need a system in which to do this. We need, you know, uh, what I call healthy lifestyle of reading. We need screening and we need a, a prevention system to set it up. We need tiers that, that are gonna provide this, uh, this instruction that's matched with the child's need. Um, and the, the, what research has shown us is that it has to be flexible and dynamic, that we don't wanna put kids through each one of the different tiers before we give them the most extreme instruction. Some kids right off the bat will show themselves to be real extreme. We wanna get them there as quickly as we can. There's evidence that suggests they're better off. Dynamic, what I mean is, what we see is kids move back and forth. So we get some kids to move ahead, but the next time we test them, they jump back. So we may need to, to change the level of intensity uh, uh, structure of, of the intervention. And then finally, this multifactorial model suggests that we're gonna have to look beyond the standard treatment protocol. Right now, that looks to be what we want to do, but we need to look at these other things that we think could supplement it, like trauma, work on trauma, attention. There's a group in Australia that's working on uh, trying to deal with anxiety at the same time they're teaching kids to learn to read. And then other disciplines have turned away from deficit only, that is working only on the problems to try to treat uh, the resilience, right? By helping uh, with parent management in the case of, of behavioral disorders, we could think about parent and teacher intervention to, to help them uh, mitigate or provide uh, resilience uh, for kids, right? Uh, so we've got a long way to go, but, but I think these models will give us some direction and uh, uh, it's been a pleasure talking with you. And I still think we have time for questions. I'm looking over here at my yeah. group back at Winward and I'll say thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Katz. I really appreciate your insights tonight. Um, before we move on to the q and I just wanna say on behalf of the Winward School, I am so grateful that you could be here for the annual Robert J. Schwartz Memorial Lecture. Um, just a reminder, this lecture was established by Mrs. by Ms. Gail Ross in memory of her husband, Robert Schwartz, who was a compassionate and dedicated former member of our Board of Trustees who passed away in 1997. And this lecture really is designed to, to, to bring his memory, uh, to honor his memory and to bring experts in the field of reading and reading disabilities to the school each spring. And I want to thank you so much for being part of that great uh, history and tradition. So, thank so you, glad Jamie. to have you. Absolutely. Appreciate so it. glad to have you. Sorry, and, I had and to I'm, wait a, wait a year to do it. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. Uh, you know, COVID has gotten in the way of so many things in our lives, and so we're but we're so glad to have you here. I wish you were in person. I wish you were here in our building, uh, and so we look forward to having you up as soon as uh, all our traveling uh, coordinations can get kind of lined up on there. But I'm really excited, actually, also to introduce uh, Annie Stutzman, who's the associate director of the Wilmer Institute, to kind of lead our Q and A for tonight. So, uh, so with that, I'll turn it over to Annie. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jamie. Uh, again, thank you, Dr. Katz, for your time and your expertise and for an all-encompassing and engrossing lecture. Um, I think this presentation gave families a new depth of knowledge and framework and for educators and practitioners, um, considerations of the trajectory of dyslexia research. So it was very fascinating. Yeah, thank, um, thank you, Annie. And, uh, thanks for working with me. You know, the, these do take a, a quite a bit of work to do this virtually and everything. So Annie's been there uh, I guess the whole year we've been back and forth. Right? Yeah, well, it was a team effort and it's very yeah. easy to work with you. So we appreciate uh, that well, you took it out with us. <clears throat> Excuse me, sorry about that. So um, as Jamie mentioned, we had requested attendees submit questions before tonight's event. So it looks like we probably have time for two um, questions to be answered fully before um, we start, you know, letting people go around that nine o'clock time. So 
This first submitted question, I think, is so important that if we only had time for one, um, I would say this would be it. So the question was, my son's previous school was hesitant to do any sort of screening in the early grades or even to encourage parents to pursue out of school testing for reading difficulties. The reason had to do with their school mission, which was social justice, and the belief that trying to diagnose language based learning disabilities early on has historically been part of the educational system's tendency to marginalize and pathologize boys of color, and that it also increases the divide between the haves and the have nots. So, uh, Dr. Katz, can you speak to the possible ways that we can use the tools of early diagnosis so that they also bring equity to our educational structures? Yeah, thanks, Annie. I, I did see this question beforehand, and I, and I said, we definitely got to address it, although I don't know the answer to it. Uh, I, I'm, I'm uh, really interested in, in uh, uh, addressing that question and, and, and uh, uh, have recognized that for some time that that what we're trying to do is set up a different system than what we have had had in the past where that is the case that that uh, uh, that we treat kids uh, differently uh, and, uh, and and unfairly uh, by the particular system that we have in, in learning disabilities identifying more boys of color or, or boys uh, with uh, uh, English as a second language as being at risk when they really uh, aren't at risk. So uh, we're engaged in a project right now uh, funded by uh, Chan Zuckerberg uh, called Reach Every Reader, where we're developing a screener and we're paying particular attention to how do we adjust this screener so we don't over-identify kids, that we actually get the right treatment to kids at the right time. I mean, what I think about is what we're trying to do is match up instruction with what the child needs at that particular moment in time, right? And so um, if you have kids that, that uh, uh, for no other reason than, than background, uh, uh, not respond, you know, not doing as well to initial instruction, do we need to have a specialized instruction for them? Do we need to refer to them as being at risk for dyslexia? I don't think so. I think we have to match up the, the, the instruction uh, for kids and we have to recognize that some kids have not had the, the preschool experiences and they're, and they're gonna benefit from that high quality instruction that we're giving all kids. And there's some evidence to suggest that. It, it, they may not show the initially the same uh, uh, tra trajectory, but there's, there's good evidence that, that for the majority of them, they do catch up after a, a period of time. So if we're in a school where there's high risk like that because of past experience, it may not, it may not, mean, it may not mean we wanna use my screener or some screener right at the beginning of the year because all the kids might look like they're at risk when they're, when they're, when they're not. The other thing we're trying to do is look at uh, environment, uh, other factors, and kind of gauging the algorithms that we're creating, right? So these are the scores, but this is the child's background, uh, so forth. And on the basis of that, should we suggest this child's at risk? See what I mean? And where I can tell you, tell you is that with English as a second language, we're working out in the California schools and they have a you know, high number of, of kids that come with from families where the majority language is, is uh, Spanish. Well, uh, having a measure that's all English is not gonna give us much information about risk. So we're trying to get additional information. If it's no more than what's the home language, what's the majority language ought to be a variable in there that can adjust our algorithm for, for risk. But what we'd also like to know is what's their, uh, what's their language like in Spanish? Because language in Spanish is gonna give us an idea of what their language is like in English, which is gonna give us an idea of what their language is in, uh, or what their reading ability is gonna be, all right? And the, the other, I can see the reason for being, you know, worried about that. But what I, what I think is the, best opportunity to get out of the situation, right, um, of, uh, of, you know, that, that might be in occur, might occur 
is being able to read well, right? And that, uh, that what I'm interested in is helping kids learn to read and get matched up with the best instruction. And if we can use screeners with that in mind, right? That we're not predetermining they're gonna have a problem, only that they're gonna need a particular level of instruction, right? Then we can work to all kids learning to, to read words because that allows you to open the world. I mean, it opens the world to you. You can, you can uh, learn from books then, right? Um, and, and do things you couldn't do because you, you can't read. And so, uh, you know, it, it's tough to deal with. I, I, I don't know all the answers. I, I'm working with colleagues that have, have more understanding of diversity than I do uh, to help us in this process and, and uh, try to do a better job. So, all right. Thank you. Not not an easy. Maybe five, give me five years and maybe exactly. <laughs> exactly. Well, we're very thankful to have researchers like you um, caring about this this vital question. Um, so it looks like we have time for one more question. We actually have time for two. I'd like two. Okay, great. Yeah. Um, so uh, we will go with if we define dyslexia as an unexpected reading disability. What can we do about students who have significant underlying problems but who have managed to read words accurately? Yeah, so you see how I set that up? If we just define them on the basis of fear, we're gonna get kids, all right, that still have some difficulties, all right, that we're not called dyslexia, that, that wouldn't qualify for having dyslexia. I think we have to keep spelling in there, particularly because that's gonna, we're gonna find that kids, kids that, that, you know, that have severe and persistent problems initially may gain some accuracy, but you guys know from your school, the one thing that hangs on is spelling. Right, that that's a recall task and recalling that information and, and speed at which you can read hangs on as, as well, as well as reading nonsense words, right? Uh, uh, so forth. So those are gonna be, have to be part of that definition at, at later, later ages. Uh, but if you don't have significant difficulties there, you can still have some pretty significant problems uh, uh, with your risk factors for dyslexia and I'm aware of that because of myself, right? That I went through all of my life with having really pretty severe phonological memory problems, right? My memory is terrible. And uh, my doc students just laugh when I try to do some of these measures that we do, right? And it's impaired, you know, listening, classroom, taking notes, so forth. So uh, kids like that need some help. I just don't think if they have that problem, they're best served with a label of dyslexia, they're better served with something related to language and by the speech language pathologist who may have had more experience with that particular. And I know I could have benefited if I'd had somebody early on that recognized that, hey, this child needs to have some help in listening in classes and, and uh, you know, following what's going on in the class and, and so forth, and having a teacher recognize that I had those difficulties and so forth. And I hope to write a paper this summer with Tiffany Hogan on, uh, we've been talking about it in, on that particular issue. All right. Great, thank you, we are big. So let's talk about the poor comprehender. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, before we move on to the last question, I do wanna mention, thank you for um, leaving your uh, contact information up. If people have, questions, they can also feel free to contact us at wi at the windwardschool.org. You can also reach out through our website and social media channels um, if you have um, questions, comments about tonight's event. And for the last question, this one refers to uh, NAEP or NAEP scores. And for viewers who are not familiar, uh, NAEP is the National Assessment of Educational Progress, also sometimes referred to as the nation's report card. So if we improve the reading skills of children at risk, would NAEP scores go up? All right, good. I, I put that in there. You probably have some idea what I'm going to say if you read the, what was in the beacon, that, that uh, article in there. Um, we'd like to think so and hope so. Uh, they're likely to go up for the kids that have, have reading problems, but the expectation that we're going to deal with this, uh, you know, 66% of the kids are reading below the proficiency level based upon uh, doing early word reading instruction is unrealistic, right? Uh, and the reason I say that is that 
that there's been numerous attempts since No Child Left Behind to really <clears throat> try to improve instruction, early literacy instruction with you know, just a budge in, in NAEP scores, all right? Uh, North Carolina, for example, has, has had a program in place for, for uh, uh, five years or so. And, and, and you know, it, they're doing really good stuff and they're teaching kids to learn to read, but it's not really impacting the NAEP scores. Some of the other states started lower and put in good uh, intervention like Mississippi, they got jumps. They were the only state last year to show a jump in NAEP. But my bet is that they're gonna hit that point to where the other states have had, and it's gonna take more than that. That NAEP really is a reflection of what kids know, right? And until we do better in addressing uh, uh, what kids know about the world, we're not gonna see those scores on, uh, on so-called reading tests. They tend to be tests of, 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 of knowledge. One way of doing that, and, and uh, uh, what I'm seeing now, is matching the test more closely with the assessment. So Louisiana is now uh, uh, substituted for their state NAEP-like exam, a, an exam that tests kids reading and writing on the curriculum that they've actually been taught in school. So the teachers know what's going to be on the test. They just don't know what the questions are, right? And that way we can measure reading at the same time we can measure knowledge. Nate, for, for, I got one more. Nate for a while was entertaining the idea that they would kind of take knowledge out of the test, you know, by giving kind of these pre, uh, you know, bits of knowledge and so forth. But you really can't take knowledge out of comprehension because it's what comprehension is about. I mean, we comprehend something and the more you know about that something, the better you able to comprehend it. And so we've got to do a better job of thinking about how we, how we move from word reading to uh, improving skills in, in uh, comprehension and other aspects of, of school. And if you invite me back at some time in the future, I'd be glad to talk about that further. So thank you. We would welcome that. And I don't know if Jamie wants, is going to pop back on just to say some closing remarks. Yeah, just wanna, again, just reinforce uh, the, the, the gratitude and appreciation we have for you being here tonight and sharing your, your expertise, your research, uh, your vantage point on early identification. Um, I just think there was so much here for our parents and for our community uh, to benefit from. And I, I will take you up on having you back to talk at, uh, at uh, so I think Andy made a note of that. So it's in stone now. So we've, we've got you on the hook for that. So we, we, we look forward to doing that, Dr. Cass. All right, thank you, Jamie. Um, nice. Thanks so much. Yeah, have a great evening. All right. Thank you all for being here tonight. All right.